In the United States today, according to the CDC, 100 million Americans suffer from prediabetes. That's about 38% of our overall population. Over one in three of us are suffering from this condition and it's something that's absolutely preventable. This episode is brought to you by Magic Mind. More about that in a minute. Recently, I've been researching the issue of insulin resistance. Now, this is something that I've cared about for many years, but after doing some research, I care about it even more, and I wanna share with you why you should care a lot about it too. A lot of us think that being insulin resistant is something that you'll know. You can just you can just kind of tell. You can go to the doctor and you'll do the blood test and it'll say, oh, hey, you're insulin resistant. But that is actually not always the case. You can go to the doctor, have a blood test done, and your fasting blood glucose show up as perfectly normal, but you've developed an insulin resistance. What happens when we have a high insulin resistance is that our cells are less permeable to glucose. Now, just a quick rundown of how all this works. The, the process of cellular respiration depends on oxygen and glucose getting into each cell, goes into the mitochondria, mitochondria produces cellular energy. That's what we use to stay alive. In a healthy person, the way this normally is supposed to work is that, okay, you'll eat something, it will increase your blood glucose, and your pancreas will release insulin. And that insulin does a lot of different things, but in this case, its main job is to allow that glucose to enter into the cell so that it can be used by the mitochondria. Whenever we have chronically high levels of glucose, which is common in the modernized world, we also have chronically high levels of insulin. And after a while, our cells develop a tolerance for this insulin. And they're just like, hey, you know, there's always insulin in the blood. I can't always be open all the time. And so it takes more insulin in order for the cell to open up and accept the glucose. This is what we call insulin resistance. It's basically like building a tolerance. Even a lot of foods that, that claim to be low carb and sugar-free, they sneak those things in there to make them hyper palatable so that we're more likely to consume them and buy them and buy them and buy them. You still need that glucose in order to survive. So your pancreas, it, it will compensate. It starts to produce more insulin. So you'll have a higher level of insulin in your blood than you normally would need in order for that cellular process to take place. Now, not only can this lead to weight gain and all these other things that, that we're pretty familiar with, but high insulin levels have been linked to cancer and hypertension. And these are two things that they're in my family and I want to make sure to be really aware of this. But they're also two of the biggest killers in the modern world, cancer and coronary heart disease. This is a major problem that a lot of us don't even realize we're facing. The first things I'll cover are going to be lifestyle and then we're gonna talk about supplement. The first big one is fasting. Now, obviously, if you stop putting glucose into your system, yes, okay, great. Now you don't have to have all of that insulin shooting out and now you can uh, not have to worry about that heightened level of insulin. If we deprive ourselves of insulin, if we deprive ourselves of the thing that shoots out the insulin, we tend to increase the sensitivity, just like if you've ever been in a room where there's a certain smell and then you go to another room and that smell is no more and you come back to that room, it's like, oh my God, how did I ever tolerate all of this whatever smell that was in here? There are many different ways to do fasting. You can go really far with it. You know, you can do a full one day fast. You can do uh, OMAD, which is the one meal a day. You can do intermittent fasting. Research shows that you don't actually have to do all that dramatic of a fast in order to see some results. In fact, if you just take as much time between meals, avoid snacking, you can at least give yourself some time where your blood glucose is low. You're giving yourself some bottom out times and so that your body can adapt. So for me, I occasionally do intermittent fasting. So there'll be times in my life when I will do maybe a 30 day uh, session of every day. I will fast for 16 to 20 hours and I'll have a very small feeding window. There'll be times when I do a full one day fast. These are all great and they have many different benefits, but the thing is you don't have to do that. My everyday regular routine is I don't eat a single calorie after dinner. I'm a Midwesterner, so we eat pretty early. We will finish eating about six or 6.30 and then I will not eat another calorie at all between that time and the next morning at about six or 6.30 a.m. 
So that's a 12 hour fasting window that I can maintain daily, regularly, and I do not fail. This is just one very easy way of maintaining my cellular health, allowing my body to have time that it's not trying to process all of that glucose. Another thing that I'm doing is weight training. Now, weight training is something that I do for many reasons as well. It's, it's just like fasting. There's a lot of benefits to weight training. But one of the benefits of weight training for insulin sensitivity is the fact that your muscles house an enormous amount of glycogen. And when you do weight training, you, you burn through all of that and it has to be replenished. Where does it take the glucose to turn into glycogen in your muscles? Out of your bloodstream, which gives your pancreas a break, which reduces the amount of sugar and insulin in your blood so that you don't have to deal with it. So you don't have all of that tolerance building up. Probably my favorite way of improving my insulin sensitivity is cold training. Now I'm walking around, it's early October in the Midwest. It's about 50 degrees outside. So that is not super cold. It's not warm either. There's research that shows that anything under 70 degrees Fahrenheit will induce brown fat activation. Now your brown fat is specifically a, a certain form of adipose tissue that we call brown because it has so many mitochondria. And when it is activated, basically what it's trying to do is produce thermal energy. It's trying to keep your body temperature at a certain level. And by doing that, it's gonna shred through a whole bunch of that glucose that's floating around, helping you to reduce your blood sugar, helping your body to come back to that state that you want it to be. There's a lot of research that shows that cold training improves insulin sensitivity. Now, you don't have to do ice baths, you don't have to do cold showers if you don't want to. However, if you do get into that, that is far more advantageous even still. The more that we cold train, the more we benefit. And the more we cold train, the more resilient we are to a lot of other stressors. There's all kinds of benefits to cold training. If you'd like to learn more about how to cold train, I wrote a complete book called A Practical Guide to Cold Training. It's in the description. It'll take you step by step from your very first cold shower all the way to walking in the snow if that's something you wanna do. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about some supplements that we can take to improve our insulin sensitivity. But first, I wanna thank Magic Mind for sponsoring this video. Magic Mind is an all-in-one nootropic blend that I have been taking every day for the past month and a half. Now, for most nootropics, you shouldn't take them every single day because if you've ever taken a nootropic before, you know that there can be a real diminishing of returns and it can actually create a dependence. That's where Magic Mind is different. The thing I really like about Magic Mind is that over the course of this month and a half, I've noticed an increase in my overall focus and effectiveness. This may be due to the fact that Magic Mind uses a supplement called Bacopa. Bacopa is a very powerful nootropic that's been shown to increase its effectiveness over time. And so now that I've been taking it a month and a half, I'm noticing that it works even better. Now the cool thing is it works the day you take it and it works better and better as you continue to take it. So I wanna thank Magic Mind once again for sponsoring this video. So we've talked a little bit about lifestyle and that really is the foundation. But there are supplements that we can use that can really help a lot. Always check with your doctor. I'm, I'm not a doctor, an astronaut, or a lawyer. Alpha lipoic acid's been used with type two diabetics. It's been used with people who are pre-diabetic and it's been used for as something that can help a person to lose weight when they are in that stage where it, they know that they're ins they have an insulin resistance. The nice thing is it's also a very powerful antioxidant and it can be really helpful for people with neuropathy. And so there's a whole host of, of benefits to taking alpha lipoic acid. I typically take around 300 milligrams of alpha lipoic acid every morning. I take that in the morning and then in the evening, I take another supplement called berberine. And berberine's a really exciting supplement, something that we've known about for a little while, but the more we've researched berberine, the more we realize how important it is for overall longevity, especially with regards to having a high insulin sensitivity. I recently found out about berberine from talking to my friend, Dr. Elena Saranova, and this is what she had to say. 
with time, what we're seeing that as we age, insulin resistance goes up, even if you're eating relatively healthy. So this is why you would want to take a supplement like berberine, um, because what it can do is it can basically regulate your sugar and it can prevent this. Berberine is shown to actually be activating the autophagy mechanism through something that is called AMPK. So when you are um, in a fat state, you have a lot of amino acids floating around, you have your mTOR activated, and then after you've run out of amino acids and calories, uh, you basically have AMPK activation. So what berberine can do for you is it can kickstart this process earlier. So you take it right after your last meal, and then you go into autophagy, you know, combine it with intermittent fasting, skip breakfast, and then, you know, you, you are in autophagy for, for a few good hours. And this is what berberine does. With the NMN bio products, we actually put milk thistle in the mix because milk thistle is a P-glycoprotein blocker. So what it does is that it blocks that and therefore incre is increasing the absorption of berberine. I think the absorption of berberine by itself, it's something like 3.8%. And then if you add milk thistle, it jumps up to 80, 85%. Guys, I hope this has been helpful for you and I am on my journey and I know that you're on yours. If you want to see some of the science I've been looking at, take a look at the links below and don't forget to go out there and be kind to one another.